Hello again, everyone. Melf here, with a special side video to my usual challenge run this time. I'll be talking about my party's current builds and answering other questions like that people have been asking a lot lately. This is right before I go into the Mountain Pass, where I'll be getting new items and changing things up a fair amount, of course. Now, before I talk about why I made the choices I made, it's important to bear in mind that they're all based on the challenge run that I'm currently doing, which is different in many ways than a normal run would be, so a lot of my choices are different accordingly. One clear example of that, I think just to demonstrate the point, is people often talk about how good paladins are in this game, because you can do a lot of smiting, do a lot of burst damage, and so forth. And you know what? That's true for a normal run. But here where I can't rest at all, and therefore can't recover spell slots at all, that would be absolutely horrible. A paladin would be worthless to me. So I need to build for a marathon rather than a sprint. Let's get into it with some of the broad strokes about the overall party, first of all. So one thing I want you to note is that Everyone has good dexterity, at least 16, and they're going to have more than that later on. And furthermore, everyone who can take the alertness feat, and is not a Gloomstalker, has the alertness feat. And Balusa will have it soon too once he gets his next level up and therefore can get a feat for the first time. I think that every character in every run basically should have good initiative. If you don't have good initiative, you're just not a good character. It's really, really important to go first. Especially when you have to mitigate enemy damage as much as I do in this run, but just in general, going first is tremendously valuable. And for this game where initiative is a d4 roll rather than the d20, every single plus one you have to initiative makes a tremendous difference. Now, looking over at our inventory here, notice a few commonalities. One is every single character has a shield, another one is every single character has two hand crossbows. And that again is something that I think that pretty much every single character in every single run should pretty much always match. Shields are really, really good in this game, because basically there's no downside to using them. You can use them with ranged weapons and just still benefit from your shield and have that great AC bonus. And a lot of shields in this game are powerfully enchanted too, and have useful AC bonuses or useful saving throw bonuses or things like that. So you really, really want to have a shield. Giving up is giving up a free enchantment slot for nothing, basically. As for hand crossbows, I said back in episode 4 when I was talking about this, I think pretty much every single character without exception, even if not proficient, should probably have two hand crossbows. The only reason to ever not do that is if you're using like, the Titan String Bow or if you have one of like, the two in the entire game decent stat stick bows that you find in like, Act 3 and Act 2. One of which gives you plus initiative, one of which gives you resistance to two elements. And even then it's still pretty iffy, it's still strong to consider just having the hand crossbows. Because being able to make that bonus action a ranged attack, no matter what you did with your main action, is really, especially in the early game, tremendously valuable. It's a huge increase to your damage and your versatility, and your ability to just you know, control who gets kills and whatnot, which is also very useful. So, highly recommend hand crossbows in every single party member all the time. Which I think is silly and bad, but that's just the way the game is. It's just optimal. Let's get into particular characters at this point. Now, I said back in episode 4, I think there's really only two valid, useful you roles for a party member to have in this game. You are either good at DPS, or damage per round, I guess, instead of you know, per second, or you're good at control casting. Tanking is a myth, healing is a noob trap. Don't waste your time doing either of those things. In 5e, almost every character is about equally good at skills anyway, and only the main character's skills really matter, so that's also kind of a non-role. So, all these party members are built to be either good at damage, or good at control, or both. Let's start with Astarian, because it's one of the simpler ones. Astarian is my main, sustainable, low-cost damage dealer. For that reason, he's a Gloomstalker Ranger, focusing on archery and with the sharpshooter feet. That makes him do a lot of attacks per round. Right now he gets two attacks for his action, plus his Gloomstalker attack in the first round, which is often the only round of combat, plus a bonus action hand crossbow attack. Plus, because he's a Bloodless Elixir, if he gets a kill with one of those attacks, which he will every single time, he gets a fifth attack. That is a lot of attacks for this level. Heck, six of them give him haste, which I often do. That's a lot of damage dealt with very low cost and very low investment, really. And being a Gloomstalker helps complement the Sharpshooter feat quite a lot. He's able to get the archery combat style, with something like, for example, a Swords Bard trying to do the same thing could not do. He also gets the ability to hide as a bonus action, which is pretty valuable too, and he gets some really good control spells as well. Things like Spike Growth is a tremendously valuable battlefield control spell. Silence is great too. Fog Cloud is great utility. Good berries are the only kind of healing I can really do on this run, but I haven't needed to use them so far, but have them just in case, basically. I do not have Hunter's Mark because, as I've talked about before, mathematically it's just kind of bad most of the time. At least if you're using hand crosses, which you should pretty much always be using. You're just better off using your bonus action to shoot with that instead. In terms of items and things like that, he's got most of the items that focus on adding to his damage, like the Caustic Band and the Gloves of Archery, but he does also have some things that give him more mobility currently. 
like Crusher's Ring and the Haste Helm. Because it's really important when you have a short range but powerful attack to be able to move up close and therefore get rid of your disadvantage that you sometimes suffer from with hand crossbows. Doesn't come up in most fights, but you want to be good at dealing with that kind of thing. He also has the Death Soccer Mantle to help give him advantage and therefore more accuracy more often. And although I don't use it very often, he has Broodmother's Revenge to do a little bit more damage too if I can use a good bear or something else to get some healing and therefore activate it. His melee weapon right now is just kind of a stat stick to give him resistance to necrotic damage, doesn't really do anything other than that. He'll get better things in the next zone, I can start buying some better items from the Githyanki Merchant and so forth. And the reason why it is a star in this role, by the way, is just the happy bonus is tremendously good for offsetting the penalties from Sharpshooter. So, I think a star in is the best possible party member pretty much all the time, and especially good in any kind of damage dealing role where you have a low accuracy, high damage attack like Sharpshooter or to a lesser extent, Great Weapon Master. Wretched thing. Let's look at Ballista next. So, Ballista, my main Dark Urge character, is a Lore Bard slash level 2 Warlock. And the plan for him basically is to be Lore Bard 10 slash Warlock 2. Now, what is the reason for that? Well, a couple of things. Number one, Lore Bard is just unambiguously the best frontman class in the game. It's not even close. You get tons of skills. You get expertise. You get jack of all trades for all the things that aren't even skills or that you can't actually invest in. You get charisma based spellcasting to complement the fact that your main character must have good charisma in this game because the main character is often forced to be the leader of conversations even if they don't initiate them. Or even if they aren't in the room sometimes. So I think Lore Bard is or Bard in general is kind of a no-brainer on your frontman character. And then Lore Bard gives you the best overall spellcasting, gives you the tremendously valuable Cutting Words ability, which can make enemies fail saving throws against key spells. Which in a run where I can't get my spell slots back in there for every spell has to count for a lot, that's really valuable. I could consider a Swords Bard instead, but there are a few reasons I didn't do that. One of them is, it'd be quite redundant with Astari, and they'd be in competition in that case over items, basically, because there just aren't that many great items for archers in the game. There's enough to outfit like one and a half characters really, really optimally. But if you have two good archer characters, they are going to be in competition for some of the most important items, and you don't really want that necessarily. Furthermore, in terms of damage resistance, if enemies are resistant to piercing, both the characters would suffer a lot. Whereas if he's now doing instead of force damage with Eldritch Blasts, I can get around that kind of vulnerability and not be weak against people who resist pierce damage. Speaking of Eldritch Blast, it's just really quite good in this game, especially with the potent robe, which I intend to get double my charisma to damage, basically. So with an investment of only two Warlock levels, I'll have a really, really great, endless, no-cost, high-damage range attack that has a push effect, too. That's pretty darn good for a low investment like that. Especially because on Honor Difficulty, as I mentioned a couple times in previous videos, let's say you have extra attack, and you get an extra action from things like Bloodless Elixir, or from haste. Well, before honor mode came out, you could get two attacks with that extra action, but in honor mode, no. You only get one attack per action. But that doesn't apply to Eldritch Blast. You get as many Eldritch Blasts as you can cast, basically. And so that'll just keep scaling up with your level. When I get to level 10, I'll have three Eldritch Blasts per action, and I'll get three actions per round pretty reliably, doing nine blasts. That's pretty darn good. So in honor difficulty, I think Warlocks are they get kind of a buff relative to the other warrior type damaging classes. In terms of items and so forth, I mostly plan to use mage armor, but I kind of ran the mage armor scrolls, so right now I'm just using light armor that I got off of Menthara, but I will switch it out for mage armor in the future for better AC. And I also use things like the spell spark, which adds light and damage to all of my attacks, and other alternates just make my Eldritch Blast be a little bit better. And for the frontman character, I think just the shapeshifter of Boonring is unparalleled for power in the early game. I'm always in disguise, always benefiting from that. I also use this ring to shore up the somewhat bad defenses that Ballista has right now. He will get better defenses once I get to the next zone and get the potent robe and get mage armor going and so forth, but every party member should try to have, by this point, at minimum 18 AC. Really, 19 is much better, and I'll soon have 20 to 21 on everyone and scale up even further from there. Armor class is very important in this game. And Ballista is currently letting the team down, but not for much longer in that department. He also, of course, will have, from being a lore bard, just tremendous spellcasting versatility and many good control spells as we get into the later game, too. Alright, so let's take a look at Karlak next. So, Astarian is kind of a main sustained damage dealer, backed up by Ballista in a secondary damage dealing role. Karlak is a main burst AoE damage dealer, because she is a Tempest Cleric slash Wizard 1. She ultimately planned to be a Tempest Cleric 11 slash Wizard 1, which will give her access to the entire Cleric spell list, basically, 
but also, crucially in this game, access to pretty much the entire wizard spell list, too. Because in this game, wizards can learn spells from scrolls if you have a matching spell slot available. So being a 5th level overall character, she has 3rd level spell slots, and therefore can learn 3rd level wizard spells like Lightning Bolt. Now, Tempest Cleric was always a really, really cool idea for a class, but was always pretty terrible in practice in 5e, because their main feature is that they can max up the damage on a Lightning or Thunder spell. But the problem is, clerics have no good Lightning or Thunder spells. But in this game now, I can have Lightning Bolt, which is actually pretty good. It does 8d6 damage. Max out, that's 48 damage. If enemies are wet to double damage of that, that's 96 damage in an AoE. That is amazing. Now, it's only once per short rest, and it's using up a 3rd level spell slot, which is pretty precious. But that will get better later on. Soon we'll have two of these Channel Divinities per short rest. And as a synergy here, having a bard in the party, have song rest, but extra short rest per long rest, basically, and thus three short rests per act rather than just the normal two. So great synergy there. That'll ultimately give me eight super lightning bolts per act as long as I have enough spell slots for it. And I buy scrolls basically to supplement my limited number of spell slots for that purpose. Besides that amazing spell, of course. She also has just great buffs and things like that from the cleric side of things. Like Bless is wonderful to put onto a star and to boost his high damage but not always perfect accuracy attacks, like with Ballista. Being able to increase the damage of other damage dealing focused party members is a good way to do damage yourself. Besides that, she's good at just throwing things to do, you know, a little bit of damage herself right now with the Hill Giant Strength Elixir. We'll probably swap that out in the future for Battle Major Elixirs to increase her spell save DC and whatnot. But for now, at least in the early game, this is pretty strong, I would say. So Overall, she's kind of a support caster who also does massive AoE damage. Assume nothing. And then, Lei Boing Zell here, of course, is the main control caster that I have. She is mostly Spore Druid with one level of Wizard. She'll eventually also have one level of Light Cleric. The reason for that is a couple things. Basically, I don't think the level 3 Druid spells are any good, except for Plant Growth, which is decent but not amazing. And I also don't think the 6th level Druid spells are any good, so I don't really care about ever getting those. Without but I do care a lot about every other druid spell level. Druids have wonderful spells at 1st level, 2nd level, 4th level, 5th level. Just not really at 6th and 3rd level. So I don't care about missing out on those. And Light Cleric gives her, you know, Bless. It gives her Warding Flare, which is a wonderful defensive option for this kind of marathon run. It gives Fairy Fire, which she has from Druid, but just having it for free is pretty nice too. So, I think that's well worth considering. And of course, being Wizard 1 for her and for Karlak gives them lots of useful things. It gives them Shield, which is the best defensive spell in the game. It gives them Find Familiar, which is amazing. Every party member has a pet to you know, give us a free advantage by blinding the enemies or by sneaking up and attacking them for free and things like that. Action. It's just great. She also has Fireball from being a wizard. So I think on almost any full caster, you should strongly consider one wizard level in this game. One other thing to talk about with regard to both Karlak and Le Boing Zell is how they balance out their stats. See, being a hybrid of a wisdom-based caster, cleric or druid, and the intelligence-based casting wizard, they really have a lot of demand on their stats, because you only get enough stat points to be good at three things, but every single character wants to have high dexterity, everyone also at least appreciates a good constitution, and then of course for wizard you want intelligence, and for cleric or druid you want wisdom. So the way to balance that out basically is with items that you substitute in certain stats. Now, Korlik has that easy right now with the Warped Headband of Intellect item, which lets her substitute out her terrible intelligence for a totally solid, at this point, 17. So that's how she gets the stats that she needs for this kind of job. But I don't really have an equivalent item right now for Lei Boing Zell. I will get one soon from the Yankee Crash to let her substitute out her dexterity and have an 18 dexterity while not investing in it at all. Then those free points will go into Wisdom instead, basically. But for now, I've chosen to just give her bad Wisdom but good intelligence because overall, Wisdom is not actually that important for druids most of the time. Because a lot of the most important control spells, like Spike Growth, don't actually allow saving throws to begin with. Whereas most of the important wizard spells she's casting do have saving throws for things like Fireball and whatnot. But you can make an argument either way, I would say. Soon this won't matter, she'll have at least a 16 in both of them once I get to the get the Yankee Crash in an episode or two and get the Gloves of Dexterity. So she has a lot of great control spells, like especially Spike Growth is just beautifully good at control in this game. Entangle is important, Silence is important once in a while, things like that. And she backs it up with decent damage too, because as a Spore Druid she gets to add you know, necrotic damage to every single attack that she makes, as long as she has temporary hit points, which she almost always has. So it's a decent amount of necrotic damage, backed up by adding it to her hand crossbow shot too, and also she has the Sparkle Hands and the Ring of Fling to add more to her throw damage attacks in the first place. So she's not as good as Ballista or Astarian, but especially in the early game she did a lot of damage and she therefore supplements her control caster role that way. So, 
To answer two other questions people had before we wrap things up today, people have asked why I call her Lei Boingzel rather than just Lei Zell. And the reason for that basically goes back to a joke put forward by some fantasy authors years ago and still kind of ongoing, which is it's kind of a cliche in the fantasy genre that some somewhat lazy authors will put apostrophes in names that aren't actually pronounced and don't mean anything, just try to spice them up and make them look more exotic without doing any kind of actual language work. And Githyanki names are full of that. They're full of apostrophes that don't actually get pronounced in any way, shape, or form. Which is not how real languages work with apostrophes at all. It's just kind of a lazy fantasy cliche. Which is not this game's fault, it's just kind of a D&D thing. So, some fantasy authors propose that to wean other authors off of doing that, we should just insistently pronounce all apostrophes and fantasy names as boing until they stop using them. So, just kind of a continuation of that joke, which I've read in several places. One other question people have been asking a fair amount recently is about this stripe in my beard there. Yeah, I've always had that since I was 13 and my beard started growing in. It just, it's blonde here, blonde everywhere else, but a white stripe there. As far as I know, I'm the only one in my family who has that. I think it's pretty neat that way. I do have some cousins who have heterochromatic eyes, so perhaps things like that run in the family, but not sure beyond that. In any case, hope that was enlightening about the party and things like that. I'm looking forward to customizing them further as we get into the rest of Act 1 here and buy some more good items in the next zone. Should be pretty interesting stuff. Thank you for watching, everyone. And a special thank you to my Patreon supporters. Macy3131, Frank Maidens, Master Knight DH, Jackie, and Lino, George Grin, Travis, Carlo Andrea 97, Cthulhu's Mom, Andrew Curzon, Trubzy, Gregory, William Wakefield, Danny Hall, Jeffrey Morse, Just Becca, Jack, Austin Livingston, Mashas01, Jacob Marshall, Nubiana, Till Fisher, Latinx Discord Colossus, Nicholas Schmuck, Kostya Nesterovich, Luke, Frederick Brune, Govan Blackrock, Dodo King 4, Marson Bialik, Maveth, Techno Waffle, Nebular, I Loop, Michael Francis, Emperor Kong 420, Robert Mackey, Mick and Balls, Daniel Seta Chicago, Stilton Flamey, Michael Murray, Lloyd, Shang Chen, Christopher Allen, Stefan Van Zyl, Eddie, Kaimu, Wendy, and Ali Kasamoglu. Have a great day, everyone.